The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge at this very moment. And today I'm super excited because we got Dr. Stephen Hayes, uh, the co-founder of Acceptance Commitment Therapy, uh, or ACT, uh, author most recently of a book called A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Towards What Matters Most. Um, and I'm super stoked to have Stephen here today because I would say uh, ACT is, is my favorite psychotherapeutic modality, and I've been geeking out about modalities <laughs> for a long time now. Um, and we're, 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 I was thinking of launching a psychotherapy cafe uh, here at the STOA. And, you know, we have people come in, practitioners, founders talk about their, you know, the practice and how it came about. So this might be um, an informal launch of that series. Uh, so that being said, uh, Stephen and I are going to riff for about uh, 20 minutes and then we'll pivot to Q&As like we normally do. If you have any questions, just throw it in the chat, call you and mute yourself, ask it to Stephen. If you don't want to be in YouTube, just indicate that. Um, so that being said, uh, Stephen. Welcome to the Stoa. You're you're on mute. I have to you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you uh, uh, unmute yourself? Yeah. yeah. Happy to be here. That's a very cool kind of uh, system that you got here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Very cool. Uh, so I imagine a few people might be aware of ACT, but my sense is that most people are not aware of it here uh, in this room. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if you could maybe give a history of it and how it relates to other modalities like CBT. Sure. Well, you know, what's different about ACT, I suppose, is, is the history and also the community that's developing it. You uh, said at the beginning, you know, I'm a co-developer. I uh, am the instigator, but a large community over 40 years has developed it. Uh, the metaphor I use, it's like, I'm one who lit the match, but the other people brought the logs and a bonfire happened. So that bonfire is not mine, but the match was. But, and there was a purpose behind it, which is to try to figure out how we can create a psychology, a behavioral science that's more adequate to the challenge of the human condition. You're looking at an old uh, Skinnerian, uh, and uh, the reason I was kind of into behavior analysis, still am, is the from rats to Walden to vision. I mean, you're looking at an old hippie and um, who lived on communes and uh, consumed lots of different chemicals and thought that that would change the world, and then looked and it turned into, you know, uh, people lying on the sidewalk with needles in the in the street, you know, it turned into a little bit of a combination of a nightmare and something that was uh, cool. We were still dealing with culturally. And, um, and then I, I also looked at uh, what was going on in psychology and I, I'd come in originally with, uh, this will go a little bit too long, but I think it might be important. I originally got into psychology because of Abraham Maslow and peak experiences and can we, create a psychology more adequate to the challenge of the human condition. Can we dig into something that would actually liberate people to live the kind of lives that they want to live? And um, the whole hippie thing and all of that was part of that. I was on a, a session recently having to be discussant about psychedelic therapy. It was the first one I was on. I got up there, started talking about the papers and just wept openly. It shocked me. But I, it was because it was about something big and it turned into something that wasn't that. Um, but now here's where I took that, that yearning, that kind of hippy dippy yearning of aspirational was the Rats from Alden 2 vision was let's get really highly polished, highly precise principles that we can use that can scale into human complexity. And yeah, the animal learning tradition is not enough. It's not. What we're doing right now is different than what the birds outside the window are doing. And so the act trajectory has been to dig down, dig down, dig down, dig down until we can finally put our feet on the ground. Um, that process was aided by a panic disorder that I developed. There's a, panic, there's a TEDx talk you can look at about my three year spin into 
not being able to eventually not being able to give a lecture to five undergraduates. I mean, and then finding that it was Hippie Hill and Eastern ideas and stuff that gave me far more traction than CBT, behavior therapy, exposure, brute force, all those kinds of things, relaxation tapes. And then wondering why is that? And where I took it was into a, a long journey into how does the human mind work, developing an underlying theory of language and cognition called relational frame theory, which I would predict, I'm 72, I'm not too far away, but when I'm dead and gone and horizontal, when it's played out, I think RFT will be more important than ACT because if it's right, we've wondered, what are we doing right now? And we came up with an answer that's different. The mind is not associative, it's relational. And it's a learned process. It's just a small step forward from the bird outside the window is doing just a little bit, just enough that evolution can catch it, given the social primates that we are as a form of extension of social cooperation and leading to symbolic reasoning. And then that changes everything because now we've got these evolutionarily ancient processes, half a billion years of operant classical conditioning crashing into something that's only a couple million years old or probably more likely half a million years old. It probably, I mean, the hominids, hominids were doing some of it almost for sure when we look at what was going on with our closely allied uh, uh, species that we even intermixed with. Um, but it's probably not all the way back to our shared uh, ancestors with the chimpanzees that don't do what your 12 month ba old baby does, we've shown in our research, that if you don't do that, you don't develop human language. You'll be so severely disabled that uh, unless you correct it, it, you won't be able to function as a normal uh, human being. And the language trained chimps don't do what your 12 month old baby does that puts you on that trajectory to do what you and I are doing right now. So this is getting a little long, but let me rein it in. Back in the day, when nobody was interested, we spent 15, 20 years after first three quick randomized trials after my turning in a different direction from panic disorder with the early precursors of ACT showing that it had unusual traction with anxiety, depression, weight loss, uh, and pain. And we worked out basically why? why? And, and it's not a complete answer, but it's a partial answer. And we came up with a, a theory that's not just a theory, it's an active research program. And if you have a kid who can't speak, you want to find a relational frame theorist. Because I guarantee you, I mean, the data are there, your kid will be better off than just putting them in front of an animal learning type behavior analyst who will be better off, it'd be better doing that than put them in front of some cognitive psychologist or something that's just going to drool on themselves. They won't know what to do with a kid who can't speak. And that moves up into a question of how does the human mind change how we interact with our own experience? And what ACT basically says is you need to put that problem solving judgmental mind on a leash or you're headed towards pain everywhere we can see. And we have studies with 10,000 people followed for 10 years with really high quality measures showing that if you haven't developed a problem, you will. If you have one, you'll have two. If you got one, it'll be more severe. It'll be more chronic. And it applies not just to mental health. It happens, applies to behavioral health. I'm sorry for the one size fits all qualities of this, but the human mind follows you wherever you go. And it, it, it uh, relates to relationships and new meta-analysis with only thir almost 13,000 people inside the meta-analytics uh, studies it applies to relationships whether or not you can win a gold medal in the Olympics, whether or not you can run your business sensibly, whether or not you can lose weight, whether or not you can step up to the challenges of physical disease, and yeah, whether or not you've got anxiety, depression, blah, 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 or know what to deal with it. And so ACT teaches us basically put the mind on a leash, learn to look at your thoughts, not just from your thoughts, learn to be more open to your your uh, emotions, bodily experiences, and so forth with what your history gives you in this situation, to be more open to it and be able to learn from it without getting entangled with it or attached to it, good, bad, or indifferent, without running from it and avoiding, but just as part of the journey, 
come into the present moment in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary from this more witnessing sense of self that we have even before language as part of our social referencing, joint attention, theory of mind skills that come from our evolutionary history as social primates, but is built out by language. The I, you, here, there, now, then skills we have to be able to imagine what it's like to be anywhere on the planet or what our grandchildren will face if we don't deal with global warming or whatever. And then using that attentional flexibility from this sense of consciousness of this increased ability to interact with the world, your own world within and the relationships among them, to put the qualities of being and doing you want to put into your behavior, i.e. your values, and then build that out in the form of values-based habits. I just said six things. Those six things are what psychological flexibility is, and psychological flexibility is the smallest set of known psychological processes with more evidence than any other such set that does more prediction of bad outcomes if you mismanage it and good outcomes if you do. I'm sorry for the self-praise, it's an empirical fact. I just finished a review of the entire world's literature, all 55,154 studies, took us two and a half years to do it on processes of change. And what I just said, those six will do more in more areas than any other set the psychology has got to give you. And um, to me, that's what ACT is. ACT is just finding a way to become more psychologically flexible and using whatever techniques we can come up with, whether some monk underneath a tree came up with it or a CBT person or a psychoanalyst, I don't care. Uh, it's not a brand name deal and put it in to people's lives. Sorry for the long riff, but that's, you asked a big question. I hope I'm um, so I might ask another big question. Um, it might, might be helpful to delineate what uh, relational uh, frame theory is yeah. and um, acceptance commitment therapy and what is the relationship between the two? Yeah, it's an evolving relationship. They started together. The very first article ever written on ACT was in 1984 uh, called Making Sense of Spirituality. And it has, if you read it, you'll see where I'm trying to dig down to the sense of consciousness, this witnessing self that uh, I ended up experiencing inside my night on the carpet at the low point of my panic disorder when I learned that I didn't need to find a way out, I needed to find a way in. And uh, I tell that story in the TEDx talk, but the relationship is a continuous and evolving one. Basically, if you, here's the way I explain the core of relational frame theory, that if I have to do it like just a five minute answer, and I'll try to do that because another 15 minute riff, it's at the bottom of the hour and we're cutting into our Q and A time. I just grabbed two things that were in front of me just because it was what my arms could reach easily. You could come up with any relation, any relation you want. So I'll, I'll do a weird one. Is the father of, that's a relation. You don't think about it very often. All relations are bi-directional. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily symmetrical. Uh, you know, is the father of implies is the child of, and then it goes in the other direction. When you combine it in networks, sometimes you, you have known unknowns. You can't put them together. If I know two things are different from something, I don't know what the relation is between those two things. But that's how relational uh, uh, operants, I believe they're operants, I'm sorry, behavior analysts. We can train them as operants, they work like operants. That's how we can hit kids who don't do this sense of self and we teach I, you, here, there, now, then, one little set of relational phenomena. But Back to is the father of. Two objects I just grabbed. If we're going to get shot, unless we come up with the an good answers, multiple answers for how the pen is the father of the glasses. Do you have any doubt you can do it? Quick answer. Unmute yourself. How's the pen the father of the glasses? Got to be good. Got to be apt. Got to fit. Designed. You designed the pen with the, uh, the glasses of the pen. Awesome. Something else? Mm -hmm. Pen's the father of reading or writing with any glasses to Okay, awesome. And you'll need the glasses to read it. Awesome, great. That's a different way. You get a score for cognitive flexibility, by the way, by the way we measure it. That shift is a shift, not just of 
of category, not just of specifics, but that's not worth spending a lot of time on, but it's there. One more, different. Pen the father glasses. The pen it isn't like you points been, fast, come on. The pen has been invented uh, long before the glasses. Say it again. The pen has been invented before the glasses. Okay, okay. Kind of a weak as father of, maybe precursor of, but I'm I'll faster. take it, I'll take it. Uh, I'll do one more. I melted this thing and made these. It's plastic, I melted it, remade it. In honor, honor will go. And they're all apt, right? They're real, they're in the objects. Wait a minute, flip it around. How's the glasses, the father of pen? We'll just take one answer, but one good apt answer. How's the glasses, the father of pen? Dum, 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 dum. Reading. The glasses let you find the pen. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, that's awesome. Perfect. Great. Now, here's the problem. We actually do this in our T book. Take anything, any noun, verb, anything. Take any relation, anything, and do that exercise. And there's always apt answers that are bound up by the formal properties of the related events. There are ones you say it really is. That little really is this little creeping elemental realism mechanism that comes from language itself, or at least the formist the division of reality is creeping into our thought processes. It has to be a lie. It has to be delusion or God herself so arranged the world that everything relates to everything else in all possible ways, which is nuts. It's not true. What's going on? Association works by connection, by formal properties or time or space. That's the only way it works. It's like chalk on one hand, on the other hand, or they look alike, seem alike. That's not what you just did. Relations are deriving one direction with an implication or a der derivation of the other direction, seemingly based on formal properties, but I could say, you know, X is bigger than Y, Y is bigger than Z. What's the relation between uh, X and Z? And you can tell me like that. What's the opposite of an opposite of an opposite? You can tell me that. I used to play games with my kids. And by the way, the one reason they're in gift and talented, I've been doing this kind of stuff in the beginning, but you know, I'd, I'd sing songs like, I have no brains. I don't not, never not, ever, ever, ever not, never not have no brains. Do I have brains? And with practice, the kids in the back seat could give me an answer at age four because they're flipping, right? Which we've learned how to do. And not, not, you can actually get the games now on your, on your cell phone. Look up, not, not. You can have your kids play these games now in your back seat. And it'll help them in terms of intelligence. We have now four randomized trials showing that three months of training of this sort will increase your fluid IQ, the part you cannot change supposedly, by eight points with blind raters in pretty well done studies. So the human mind is a relational process. And it learn it in one direction, derive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. That's the ditty that explains 40 years of work. And it's not just blah, 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 Chomsky, blah, 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 Wittgenstein, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, not, I'm not being disrespectful, but you know, I want to put my um, developing disabled kid in front of Chomsky and see what he can do. And I can guarantee you he can't do anything with, with it. Yeah, he's moving in the right direction, by the way, recently. But we can, and so pridefully I'd say, now back to act, I said I wouldn't do 15 minutes and here I've done it. So what, well, here's one, so what? You wanna clean up your cognitive ecology when anything can relate to anything in all possible ways? I've done the math. If you have eight words and eight relations with eight objects, you have 4,000 relationships that are afforded. Do the math. It isn't simple frack. You, you do the math around relations to relations, objects to objects, et cetera. Eight gives you 4,000. How many things are in your head that you could relate to something else? I've tried the math on this and you end up with answers like this. You have about as many relations implicit in your head as there are molecules in the universe. 
You're going to clean that up? Really? You're filled with racist crap. You're filled with bigoted, disgusting, horrible stuff. And there's no delete button in the nervous system. That's healthy. You know, the old joke, short, short of a frontal lobotomy or a bottle in front of me. So number one, you're not going to clean it up. Number two, when you try to clean it up, you make it more accessible. Thought suppression, avoidance, don't think of, makes it more likely, not less likely, it goes down and up. Yeah, you can suppress and it'll get more frequent. And by the way, everything you do to distract, suppress, or go somewhere else now becomes a cue for this. If I said, think of the opposite of glasses and you gave me an answer, I could then use it to remind you of glasses. We did a, is the father of, but if I did is different from, it would now be, an, we've just now laid down a neurobiological track. And I can tell you what that slide is, a panic disordered person in recovery. At the height of my problems, the word relaxation caused panic attacks. Try to be a clinical psychologist and do that. Emotion gave me panic attacks. And it's a known thing called relaxation induced panic in the literature. So the logical, reasonable, sensible things we do with our own self doubts, our own painful memories, our traumatic things, etc., cetera, are train wrecks. And RFT implies that learn it in one, derive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. The only part of that syllogism that's sensible is change what they do. So what's in act? Well, for example, you got a thought here that's really bothering you, like deep down, I'm a pervert. See, deep down, there's something wrong with me. I'm mean, I'm evil, you can't trust me. You try to suppress that, that thing will get bigger, easier to access, more central, more focus. What do we do in act? We might sing it to the tune of happy birthday. We might remind ourselves that bad spelled backwards is dab. We might say it in the voice of our least favored politician. No guesses as to who that might be. Uh, we might picture when we first started struggling with this thought, picture how old we were, put that person in front of you. I bet you they're five, six, seven years old. They're not 18. And the stuff that bothers you at two in the morning is in your head, you can take it back, probably. Put that person in front of you and have them say these self-critical thoughts that torture you in their little voice in front of you. And see what it pulls from you. And I bet you it doesn't pull, snap out of it, you big baby. So can you show yourself some self-compassion? Can you be kind to yourself about the fact that we're the historical beings that invented this wonderful thing that gives us the ability to talk? I don't know how far away. Some people may be on the other side of the world listening to me right now. What a credible thing. What an amazing thing. This is more powerful than landed folks on the moon by a thousand times. And you want to see anything sick happen in the world? You got a mother who threw her babies off a bridge. You can see the video live. You know, your exposure to pain, comparison, and judgment, which are the toxic uh, triad, and the, without any encouragement for being more open, kind, mindful, uh, you know, it, our, our kids are more than a standard deviation worse and anxiety, depression, substance abuse than they were 30 years ago. And you can't tell me it's a self-report because it's freaking suicide rates. Don't be telling me it's self-report. It's young people. So something's wrong and we need modern minds for this modern world. We need to be able to dig down to what the core processes are. So sorry for once again, getting a 15 minute rant from me. I do solemnly swear that in the Q and A period, I will not do this, but um, we took the time to hack down to what are the processes we're focusing on six and psychological flexibility. You can tell you, Remind yourself what the six are by basically being more open, aware, and actively engaged in a values-based journey. And when you see how they relate empirically, they're really one thing. 
learn to be more psychologically flexible and less psychologically inflexible. And it fits within RFT because uh, we can't train the mind the way the mind tells us to train it. You know, the mind will tell you it's the most important organ in your body until you notice which organ is telling you that. We better learn to put it on a leash and use it when it's useful and not when it's not. And so there's a whole lot of other things like being able to observe and describe, like watching the sunset, we say, wow, and then we know enough to shut up. We don't say a little more pink, God. If we have a crying child in front of us, we do the same thing. We say, wow, that must have really hurt. We don't say snap out of it. So there's parts of us that are wiser and that fit with what psychology is showing is how you create a life worth living. And um, our mental health system is full of this objectification and dehumanization of diagnostic categories and other scientific bullshit. And then gigantic amounts of chemicals to manage it. Uh, one out of four women ran into depressants last year in the United States of America. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. So rant over, but uh, acceptance, diffusion, what we call it, backing up the mind, et cetera, come out of um, what RFT suggests about how you manage a relational ability that wonderful and horrifying that we can imagine futures that have never been and we can torture ourselves with futures that have never been or may never be or uplift ourselves with it someone in the chat said holy shit this man is preaching and the spirit is moving so um <laughs> it's resonating what you're saying my friend um so if you have any questions start putting them in the chat I'll, I'll ask one more. Um, yeah, like uh, the Stoa is not a place to practice Stoicism. There's only like one or two actual Stoics come here, and myself included. Um, and what I really loved about ACT is it maps over to a lot of Stoicism. And um, I got one of the books, uh, Cognitive Diffusion. They have all these exercises on yeah. like, how to do it. So it's a really good book. Um, I'm wondering if you could, is there any exercise we can do right now? Or maybe you can just tell us or we can do it together, um, whether it's cognitive diffusion or something else? Oh, sure. Well, I mentioned some cognitive diffusion uh, ones uh, earlier. And yeah, you can take just a moment to do it. Uh, be careful with these because they may sound like you're ridiculing yourself, which is why I did the little remembering yourself as a young person, because you won't do that. And this is not about you're silly, you're ridiculous. This is about trying the all language monster. That's something like the movie Alien, that, oh, enough that we can look at it, not just from it. No, I'm not thinking anything. This just sucks. You know, that, that um, kind of mindless posture we often get in. Think of something that bothers you, that really bothers you, that, uh, that has to do with your history, and then it's been around a while. And especially something that has some sort of history to it, some sort of emotional side to it, some way it shows up in your body, but also some way that it shows up in the form of judgment. Like I'm a person who, or deep down I fear that, or something that points back at you. And um, get yourself real clear on that. Bring it down to a sentence. And then remember how old that is, how long you've been thinking some things like that. And then I'd ask you to think that thought very slowly. Just extend it out so it would take like 20 seconds to say it, if, if it's only a few words. And savor it the way you would uh, putting a strawberry in your mouth and trying to taste it where you can actually feel the weight of it or feel the history of it or feel the familiarity of it. But now we're gonna do it a different way. Like if uh, it's, I'm bad, I, I want you to think it sort of like this. Uh, uh, 
then as you're doing that, while you're doing it, are you doing it? Notice who's noticing. Don't turn it into a thought. I'm just asking you to catch because it's gone already. Don't put it into words because there's no it here. I just want to catch that this resides in awareness. And there's a person thinking. And that thought claims to be about you. Is it really about the part of you that just noticed that thought? Or is it about other things having to do with your history and circumstances? It's like, what would it be like if you touched that part of you that just for an instant when you show up and you notice that you're and that there's a distinction that you allowed that moving finger to write those thoughts with just a little bit of separation. So it's more like, let's summarize it this way. Whatever thought you're having, restate it, but you only have to make one little tweak on it. Call it what it is. If it was a thought, call it a thought. If it's a feeling, call it a feeling. Baba Ramdas called this cubby holing. I love it. Uh, the late uh, Baba Ramdas. So, like, if you're thinking I'm bad, let's just think it again now, but with this tiny modification that makes it more true. I'm having the thought, I'm bad. Cool. What, like, like that's your enemy? Really? If that's your enemy, you better learn to run faster than light speed because you're going to have to live your history that would leave that to show up, that you came by it honestly. Somebody actually told you, or you derived it, or you did something that wasn't, really wasn't all that honorable. But if you're going to run from it, you're going to groove your path to it, and it will dominate you even more. So could you catch that there's a part of you that can make choices and that isn't just what you're talking about. About means near and out. It's ab out, like near normal, ab different, not normal, ab normal, ab out. It means not. So when your mind's telling you about you, it's not you. It's you thinking it. The thought's not you. There's no way for thoughts to become you. You're just talking. That's fine. What else? Thank, you know, one of the diffusion methods, give your mind a name and thank it for all of its work. Thanks, George, for the thought. I'm bad. Thanks. You got anything else to say? Not in a dismissive way. I mean, really, genuinely. Cool. Thank you. I'm glad I got you. As a fellow traveler, I wouldn't want to be my dog, D-O-G. The freaking uh, coyotes would, would eat her in a minute where I live. But, um, but that doesn't mean that I am what my verbal processes are doing to me and ab out me. Does that help? Shorter rant, still a rant. God, I got to stop. Otherwise, you'd be going, I believe. <laughs> I do get a little of this forever, I guess. Just out of, I, I do think maybe this is useful. And I'm sorry I get excited about it. But. Yeah, uh, my what mind. Got? Uh, what are they saying in the chat? So, to preface this question, um, I'm going to take an Andy in a moment. Uh, we have a, a wisdom gym at the STOA where we have like weekly sessions on people do breath work, intersubjective practices, all sorts of cool stuff. So um, with that said, I will take an uh, Andy. So Stephen, thanks for coming and doing this. I'm wondering if there's a way with so many people needing mental health reframing and the cost of therapy and professional um, advice being prohibitive for many or not accessible. Is there a way that non-therapists can train in this and absolutely with each other? You know, one of the things we've done, if you go to the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, it's named after the philosophy of science, contextualism from pragmatism really, but focused on being able to make things different. But it's about 9,400 people, 28, seven chapters around the world, blah, blah, blah. 
And public members are not only welcome, they're actively part of the leadership and they're on the committees and stuff like that. And the, these processes you can put into parenting, you put into teaching, you put in running your business, you can put into your relationship working. So we don't really frankly give a shit about this guild stuff. And so, uh, you know, OTs, PTs, nurses, teachers, you know, anybody in there, you know, you can use these processes. That's an empirical fact. And there's actually books and stuff that will help you do it. And, you know, uh, part of what you're saying, you know, I've tried to put some of these things into self-help books and apps and websites, but do it in a very open way. There's way, 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 way more act work out there than anything I've ever touched. And uh, the one thing you swear on to if you ever become a recognized trainer is, is you won't make proprietary claims and you won't certify people. Because we're, we're about wanting to be Linux, not Microsoft. And so uh, take it, seal our stuff, rename it, it was great. But put it someplace where it'll make a difference. And um, so you can do it if you have a serious interest inside ACBS, just search for contextualscience.org and then go into your membership area and join the listserv so you can watch the conversation. But you can just Google it and find web, web pro, uh, you know, Facebook groups talking about it and, and so forth in almost any area of life you can imagine from sports to cancer to depression, you, know, you pick it. And um, explore it, just sort of check it out. Uh, a good or i'm sorry for the you know i do make money from books but that book over my shoulder liberated mind tells the science story personal story and kind of walks you through it was kind of a think book self-help book philosophy of science rft it's all in there it took me 11 years to write it and it's about the 40-year journey that the community's been on um and you'll see at the end section three i just walk after, after area after area after area where these principles and processes have been applied and make a difference. You know, in the World Health Organization, when COVID happened, they didn't have any randomized trials on COVID. You go there, what do they give you? They give you an act cartoon book. I'm send the link out. Why? Because we had done works on cartoon books and an audio tape with South Sudanese refugees in Uganda and showing that we could get more of an improvement with people who are illiterate and have nothing but, you know, their kids and their clothes, nothing, sitting in dirt. We could get effect sizes that are large with a randomized trial done to the nines funded by the World Health Organization. I mean, believe me, this is how big science is supposed to be done, I guess, but it's you know, gold-plated doorknobs, you know, get every little possible methodological check and so forth. Um, uh, and it, effect sizes are as large as you'd get for self-help here in the West. So uh, that's an example. Uh, there's an app that just got written up in JAMA Internal Medicine. The Surgeon General put it in its report. There a report coming out from the Surgeon General. We were able to beat the National Cancer Institute CBT app by a significant one-year follow-up on smoking. So, you know, there's a cynicism about science that we're all just kind of relabeling what we already know and stuff, but I don't think that's true. I mean, it's just not act uber allis, but if you dig down to the processes and then put them out there in a way that they can be given away, made available really easily, like the free cartoon book from uh, Who, um, you can help people. And we're trying to do that step up to that challenge. It's a great question and the challenge of our times. You know, if we didn't know it before, but do we know it after COVID? Mental health is not one out of five, it's five out of five. Everybody is freaked out about COVID or if you're not, you're not awake. When you look at what's happening and how people are suffering, if it's not you, it's somebody else, wake up. And so what are we gonna do about that? We better pass that challenge that question. Uh, any follow-up, Andy? No. Uh, Anjan, you had a question. Stephen, thank you. I, I've been going through a rough patch and your work has been um, enormously helpful for me. Um, my question is, uh, if negative schemas such as insecurity, arrogance, narcissism, et cetera, were somehow repurposed 
in life for adaptive purposes, drive, motivation, confidence, self-belief, etc. How does one deal with the fallout of seeing through these schemas and thus um, losing their adaptive value? Um, It's a good question, man. And there's a fear in there, you know, like when I'm what I just did about noticing who's noticing and then looking at the, the self-critical thought, this self-critical thought has been used as a freaking whip to get yourself to do stuff. Almost certainly it's had an adaptive value, probably to some degree. Now it may have also fed an addiction or also broken up your relationships or also pushed you into a depressive downturn. I mean, you probably know there's a dark side to it, but you've been kind of, kind of comfortable with it and maybe even used it to squeeze that midnight studying for that exam or that finally getting the report in that was due last Tuesday or whatever the thing is, yeah? And when we notice it, my clients say to me things like, well, what if I'm a psychopath? What if I'm evil? If I were to be okay about myself, what if I'm just a lazy slug? Uh, Here's the deal. Uh, I think we can use our thoughts as a kind of game without having them master us. And I'm fine with sort of playing the game that getting that report in is really important or else. Try different games. See the ones that you, you use the best. Now, here's one thing you'll find out. And there's a good science behind this. A positive, appetitive, values-based game is a softer but more certain way to get that report done. There's a danger inside, let's say, the narcissistic achiever. And aren't we all seeing this right now? Today, if you live in the U.S., as the electors are voting and part of you says, is this freaking narcissist going to take it the next step? What if it worked? You know, so I'm fine with using it, but here's the deal. Let's try different thoughts and see how they play. Notice who's noticing, notice what the purpose is. And then let's take what's useful and leave the rest. And my prediction would be based on 3000 studies, (laughs) but not based on you. So you maybe for you, maybe not. And I'm cool. If you want to whip yourself and make yourself do stuff, go for it. And my prediction would be that the softer, more repetitive approach of what I really want to be about is X will be just as motivating, but the less dehumanizing of you and less likely to spill over into the objectification and dehumanization of others. Because what's inside some of those attachments to schemas is insensitivity to the context you're in. The earliest work when we were in that 15, 20 years of darkness and only darkness to the world, that was not dark to me, I was having a hell of a time. But when I'm giving talks with only five people in the audience back then, you know, as we showed that a simple verbal rule like do this in order order to earn points was enough to make you completely insensitive to the actual changes in the task that were unannounced. Once you had a verbal rule in your head, First, you don't succeed, try, try again. You know, the possibility of this ain't working, I should quit, doesn't even show up. So the diffusion methods, what I was just using, and the values focus, as opposed to this performance-based or uh, I'm wonderful and should be given prizes because I sprung from the head of Zeus kind of thing that we're feeding our kids on, um, is a softer, riskier, What if I'm a psychopath? Okay, hold that thought lightly. And by the way, I'll just tell you, just to whisper, psychopaths don't worry about being psychopaths. They don't. So if you're worried about it, you just passed. You're cool. But that sounds too much like reassurance. So I'm only whispering it to you. But um, variation and selection, try it out. Let's see. The mind tells you it's risky. Your heart and behavior and experience may tell you something different. But you won't even get to that. You won't even have that flexibility. You won't even have that repertoire until you first rein in the mind. Because the uh, you know, analytic judgmental mind is so dominant uh, that it just uh, recategorizes, reinterprets all those cognitive errors and so forth that are kind of almost built in. 
confirmation bias, you name it. Uh, cognitive scientists are good on that. They're not always good on telling you what to do about that. Psychotherapists are a little better at telling you what to do. And we did the work in the basement to be able to play both games. But um, yeah, that's how I'd answer it. Any follow-up questions? Um, maybe a slight follow-up. Um, I think of the example of when you have nobody to teach you tennis and you just kind of swing and just hit yeah. the ball, do it yourself. Um, but then you have an instructor who says, okay, do this with your wrist and do this and then go there and that. And suddenly now you're all in your head. Um, I'm wondering as one enters a process like this, like what do you do if you find yourself being too self-referential or too in your head or too? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and, you know, let's just take the advice you give. When you're a little eager, hold the bat this way, don't hold it this way. It makes perfect sense. Anybody knows about holding the bat that way? You cannot hit. You have to have it with your dominant hand on top, okay? Because you can't roll your wrist this way. You can kind of hit it, but not very well. You say that to a big leader, a leaguer, and that's their last advice you're going to give because you'll be shown the door. I didn't wear my Toronto Blue Days shirt here, but I spent the spring training with them. Why? Because the entire mental performance team for Toronto Blue Jays, and not just them, the Red Sox, the 76ers, and on and on, people. Why? Because what's in sports coaching is mostly a train wreck. Why? Because it's coaches who learned with the kids to say this, and then they get up with these expertise, and it's totally different. Because what expert folks need to do is to trust their training and their their body's ability to do things that happen so fast, you can't even categorize it. It's like an expert pianist playing the fight of the bumblebee. Before you're pushing the next key before you, your brain literally knows you pushed the last key or you can't play the note. You wanna hit a hundred mile an hour fastball? Man, you better trust your training. As Yogi Berra said, you know, don't think, just hit. That's fine, Yogi, how do I not think? Well, we have tools we can use for that. And so I'm down with what you're saying that rules can be helpful, but they also create a, a ceiling for you. So you better have the ways, rules to get you going, non-rules to put it aside. Have you ever been on a date with somebody when you can feel they've been reading the book on how to pick up uh, members of the opposite sex? How was your week last week? I mean, you wanna run for the freaking door. Now it might be better than somebody just doing a, a rant or something and not even noticing that they're on a date with somebody. Uh, yeah, having the rule ask the other person about what they you know, would probably be better than that. But you better learn how to actually do something more like look in the eyes of the other you're with, connect in consciousness with them and learn how to be yourself and to be truly interested in other human beings and creating connection between them. If you really wanna belong and be part of relationships, that skill's gonna to have to be learned sooner or later. And anyone in here who's had long-term relationships knows that you never get it right. You're always just getting a little better. So, uh, how can you do that? Well, rein in the mind, learn how to focus on the consequences that you want, like belonging, feeling, understanding, competence, like that, awareness, compassion, like that. What you, you tell me, whatever they are, and it's metaphorically the same as hitting the tennis ball, right? But it may be a little more sophisticated. It's not the just hit the tennis ball off the stick. This is now a backhand with a hundred mile an hour. You know, this is more graduated stuff. Like when your significant other comes in and rips you out a new orifice because of something you did and everything screams in you to just be right and show how she's wrong. It's a she for me, that's the she, excuse me. Flip it, the gender, if it's a different for you. And boy, that's hard because you, you just want to be right and defend yourself and you're misunderstood and all that kind of stuff. And you may need to learn to shut up and listen and take the point. And maybe you are inside male privilege yet again, damn it, God. 
invisible, hard to see, whatever the thing is. So, uh, and ACT will do that. If you, if you find some traction there and you're doing some ACT stuff and you've found some, follow it out a little bit, get in a little deeper to it and you'll find that it isn't just like initial rules. It gives you a way to allow your experience to be your teacher, which is if you're gonna stay inside a sports metaphor, that's exactly what we do with the Blue Jays. Because what, you know, metaphor, if I could do a, a sports metaphor, because everything is a sports metaphor work on the Blue Jays. We don't talk about acceptance, values, everything. That, you know, uh, we call living your legacy. That's values. Uh, committed action is full send. I didn't even know what full send means. Did anybody know what it means? It means 100% go for it. And, you know, young athletes, that's the way they talk. Um, you know, so it, here's the way we, we express it. It's, it's like a, a person with somebody on base who, who, who does a, a half wind up and we sort of say, okay, get your feet on the ground. That's presence and mindfulness. Just like you go like this, let that be a metaphor for everything comes in. Okay, all those self doubts, all those feelings, etc. It's all on here. I'm not gonna have to push anything out. The focus on the catcher Smith. What am I about here? What am I up to? Now that I'm on board with my history and grounded in consciousness in this moment, you see the metaphor? Then full send. I'm giving you everything I got. Not mindy. My mind doesn't know how to pitch, but I'm going to trust my, you know, 30,000 hours of physical training that's going to allow me to throw that 100 mile an hour fastball, even with a Tommy John surgery last year. And if I do it wrong, I will never pitch again. You know, people have to do hard things. Love is hard, commitment is hard. Being okay about yourself is hard, scary. What if I'm a psychopath? So, yeah, it's not that complicated. It's really simple, but it's really complicated because your mind gets in the way. Right. Um, Stephen, do you, we have five minutes until the top yeah. of the hour. Can we sneak in another question or should we end sure, it here? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. I so can actually ask, answer things quickly, but. <laughs> but I will. Um, Susanna, uh, you'll be the last question if you're going to meet yourself. It, you're on mute still. Yeah, you're still on mute. We'll give you one more chance. And the microphone. Okay. If I'll, I'll read her question on okay. her behalf then. Um, could you say more, Stephen, about relational frame theory and the simplest explanation as to what it means for the problems of an of our unruly minds? Well, I think it, it means you're going to have to learn how to back up, watch it, uh, learn habits of diminishing its dominance over your more. Now, what, what are you diminishing? You're diminishing the analytic, judgmental, predictive mode of mind. What are you fostering? You're fostering an observe, describe mode of mind, the wowfulness part. Now I'm feeling this. Now I'm noticing that. Look at that sunset. Listen to that crying child. It's fine to have language be part of it. It also means listening more carefully to what your body is doing, to those flickers of emotion, to that felt sense, to your intuition to catching this part that's ineffable, that's fostered in part by language, but started before language of this witnessing, observing, purely conscious part of you, not even conscious of anything, but just being an aware being. Uh, it, it means being more connected, I think, to the others and to life around you, more in touch with the context that you're in and the sense of what's happening around you. You may have sensed, you know, like in your home, you can feel that something's wrong sometimes with people who are living with you. You don't even know why. You can't just trust this one problem solving side of you. It's great for doing your taxes or fixing your car. I got to install electrical outlet here right after this. It'll be great for keeping me from getting electrocuted. 
but it's just horrible in terms of, is it okay to be me? What am I really up to? What kind of life do I wanna live? And RFT sort of orients you to how to slow that down, gives you a little warning, but it also helps you to see how to motivate, like that question about what motivates me if I don't have my schemas. When you get in touch with that deep yearning for meaning and purpose and you decide affirmatively that sue me for, uh, you know, let me give you an example. After my second divorce, I went through a process and I'm, oh God. And then so, somewhere a thought comes really clear in my mind. Uh, love matters to me. I want to learn how to do a better job of being a loving partner. Didn't do such a good job on the, on the last one. Well, you know, having those words, you know, and then be able to look at your behavior and say, am I doing that lovingly? Where the quality of action gives you that continuous little check when you get up in the morning and you're tempted to climb into why your wife was wrong because you see being such a pain in the ass yesterday. And you have a choice as to whether or not make a cup of coffee the way she really likes it or just maybe today you don't do that because she was such an asshole yesterday. You know, so I think we can use language without having it use us, but there's more to us. The rest of the creation out there, that bird outside the window is surviving pretty well a variation selection driven by other processes. And we didn't break that tradition when we added this evolutionarily recent kid on the block. So there's more to us. Let's learn how to use it. And there's a book called Mastering the Clinical Conversation if you're a practitioner. There's also one called Learning RFT if you're just interested in the underlying theory that will help walk that out. Right. So we'll end it here. Um, uh, Susanna, you're, you're, you're off mute now. Thank you so much. And sorry, I, I was having trouble getting myself unmuted. It's just such an honor to hear directly from you. I, it's awesome, those so-called rants. Is, um, cool. Well, it was really cool. wonderful to be here with you and you and you and all of you and to watch your faces a little bit. Thank you for spending time with me and allowing me to be a little part of your journey. I hope it's useful. And if you find that you need to, you know, there's millions of books in print and I always hesitate saying this, but if you've done your homework, you've gone out, you've tried to find out and you really need some help from the old bald guy, just email me. It's, I'm a, my Gmail address is just my name, stephenchayes at gmail.com. And for uh, 50 years or 40 years or whatever, I've, I've tried to answer every missive sent to me back in the day, written now in the Gmail. So, uh, I will answer it, maybe not immediately, but I will try to get you what you need. Beautiful. So uh, I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but Stephen, uh, we'd love to have you back at the STOA and thanks so much for coming today and blessing us with your presence and wisdom. It was uh, a treat and a joy. Awesome. Peace, love, and life, gang, and be safe out there. That virus wants to kill you. <laughs> uh, so tomorrow we have uh, Otto Schwarmer from uh, Theory U going to visit us. Uh, that's uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. That should be a really fun um, Theory U. Everyone talks about that, so that should be exciting. And if you have uh, more events, you can check out the store.ca. We have a Patreon and a Substack. Forrest is, uh, Landry is coming for a SenseMaker in series uh, at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time, so about two hours. So hope to see you then. All right, everyone. Take care.